Hello and welcome to Bright Talks, the cultural podcast series by the Bath Royal Literary and Scientific Institution. Bright Talks brings you leading speakers on many topics, including science, literature, philosophy, world affairs, and many more. I'm Andreas Vasmud, and we begin Bright Talks with a philosophy series on the meaning of existence, which I gave at the Bath Royal. This is episode two, From Religion to Philosophy. I hope you enjoy the podcast and please give us feedback on your platform of choice. Hello and welcome to part two of The Meaning of Existence. My name is Andreas Vasmut and I'm the philosophy co-convener at the BLSI. Thank you very much for your very positive and constructive feedback on the first part of this series. Much appreciated and I look forward to receiving more of your feedback over the next few lectures. Please remember the old edict, praise in public and constructive criticism in private. That would be much appreciated. Uh, well, let's get on today's subject, which is a transition from religion to philosophy. Before we do, let's do a little recap in terms of what we learned last time on the meaning of existence. Uh, and we looked at the transition from ritual to religion. The key substance from the, the last lecture was really that the meaning of existence stretches back far into uh, the back uh, prehistory, including ritual funerary rites, abstract thought, complex language, artistic expression and metaphysical myths. And uh, what is very clear nowadays is that uh, this is going back many, many thousands of years uh, uh, later than we initially thought. You know, this is going back to anywhere between 60 to 100,000 uh, BCE. The other thing we discovered is that the transition into religion included the notion of, of a notion of moving out of chaos into some form of order through common tenets, scriptures, and the celebration of the divine and uh, the sacred. A purpose and the meaning of existence was based on revelation and faith. Uh, it is not something where you are uh, discovering the meaning of existence through uh, exploring this yourself. This is something bestowed and given to you uh, as something to live your life by. And uh, then finally, it is actually living in accordance with the divine, which includes the rituals, the practices, the beliefs and adherence to key tenets uh, that uh, make you a member of a particular faith, of a particular religion uh, with certain duties and obligations uh, to fulfill. Uh, now, we will be covering the eastern side of things uh, a little bit more in terms of the next lecture, which is all about the wisdom of the East. But we've already seen that the Eastern religions are treating, uh, the, their focus is very different. Whereas in the Western uh, religions, the focus is particularly outward and, and uh, adhering to concepts to appease uh, your God or gods. Uh, in the East, it's a much more inward journey to actually reflect on yourself as part of the whole, in fact, the whole of the universe. Now, this is religious overtones, but also has uh, clear philosophical messages. And that is what we'll be discovering, discovering in uh, lecture three, which is the wisdom of the East. Good. Well, we're now getting to the transition. Uh, from revelation uh, or religion to investigation, which is philosophy. Philosophy is literally translated as the love of wisdom. And uh, the Greeks had various definitions of wisdom and also de definitions of love. Philo, philia, is actually its brotherly love, familiar love, uh, rather than uh, any other love. So this is uh, points to the way that actually philosophy is a process and an engagement in the world with other people rather than something that uh, you do by yourself. And that's a very important concept that uh, we'll be coming back to uh, during this lecture, but also future lectures. Uh, one of the key 
aspects, uh, which was first, I think, mentioned by uh, by Immanuel Kant, but it is another a key aspect of philosophy, and that is sapere ode, which is translated sometimes as dare to be wise, but often it is actually be brave to explore the world for yourself. And I think that's the key difference uh, between philosophy and revelation. Uh, you, know, you, ex you expect it to accept the tenets of a religion uh, to be revealed and God sometimes to be imminent in that, uh, in that world, but uh, not necessarily. Whereas as far as philosophy is concerned, it is an exploration. It's a personal, but also a joint exploration to actually discover truths and wisdoms in, in the world. Thirdly, the examined life as uh, is very important as uh, Socrates said himself the unexamined life is not worth living uh, so you, unless you explore life and find meaning in itself and finding the truth out for yourselves you're not leading a full life I mean some some jokers have subsequently said that actually a life examined too closely is not worth living either because you would be suffering from paralysis by analysis but uh, Socrates had a very clear idea. You need to explore and examine your life and you need to test your assumptions uh, in what you're actually creating. Now, philosophy is also different in terms of, it comes in different uh, guises. It comes in terms of metaphysics, which is the, the study of being, uh, in terms of epistemology, which is about uh, knowledge, ethics in terms of how we should lead our lives, aesthetics, uh, beauty and what it means to lead a good life and also politics in terms of what it means to actually uh, cohere and coalesce together in a, in a society. Next, ontology is the study of the nature of being, becoming and existence. And I suppose uh, whilst we draw on other strands of philosophy uh, throughout the series here, I think the main thrust really is, is to explore the nature of being, becoming and existence. What does it mean to lead a good life? What does it mean? What is the purpose of my life, our life and uh, our collective existences? That's what we're trying to cover uh, from a historical but also from a philosophical uh, point of view. Ontology basically raises clear differences between the Western and Eastern uh, and philosophical approaches, which I've already mentioned. Um, the East has a much more holistic and inward looking uh, perspective where our, our existence is part of the universe uh, rather than something separate, which is not the case in most Western traditions in philosophy, which sees uh, there is a sharp divide between the subject and the object, which we'll come back to at some point. So this all raises the questions of being and becoming. Now being, which is existence, essence, a state and the process of reality rather than an entity. So this is a process of being rather than the being. Uh, becoming is change, the transition from one state of being to another or the realization of potential as Aristotle would uh, call it. Well, let's dwell and let's go to the ancients because uh, the initial uh, creation of philosophy started in the West, at least, certainly has been attributed to uh, Thales or Thales, uh, who lived in the uh, 7th century uh, BCE. And really the concern here was about the, the state and the, na the form of nature. Now, as far as uh, Thales is concerned, everything is made of water, everything is full of gods, and the soul is immortal. His follower, Anaximander, again a pupil of his, uh, believed that the world existed of the indefinite, the appearon, which is actually similar to uh, the concept later on of the ether. The infinite and the unlimited uh, from which everything arises and returns. So he actually saw this as an ongoing process of going into existing and fading out of existence. Anaximenes, who followed in the 6th century uh, BCE, uh, believed that everything was made of air. 
Uh, we don't know whether he meant by that actually particles or a more of an atomic theory, but everything clearly he saw uh, air being instrumental in terms of breathing and breathing life into things. Anaxagoras, uh, again in the 5th century uh, BCE now, believed that everything consists of everything. So this is a very different way of looking at it. It's, it's effectively, he's believing there is an infinitely dense pebble. Everything contains everything within it. And this is really uh, like the perception of hologram, where every tiny piece of the hologram contains within it the totality of the picture. This is probably the, the best way of, of understanding Anaxoragas. Pythagoras is probably uh, one of the most uh, famous of pre-Socratic uh, philosophers, and he believes that uh, everything can be reduced to mathematics in terms of philosophy. In fact, the whole of existence can be explained in terms of mathematics. You know, even the soul and justice is immortal. And everything can be explained, even concepts, uh, abstract concepts, like I just mentioned, justice, would be something like four. It can be all squared. And clearly, uh, when uh, one of his contemporaries uh, pointed out, I think it was Hippasus, pointed out irrational numbers, uh, it was believed that he was actually drowned at sea. Now, it was never actually uh, uh, suggested that that was down to, to the Pythagorean creed, but the suspicion clearly is there. Good, I shall now move forward to Heraclitus, who again is not looking just at the state of things, but actually how things change. Uh, he's the philosopher of change, and uh, as, as you probably know, his famous saying is, you cannot step into the same river twice, because why not? Well, because whilst you're stepping into the river, you yourself are changing. Your foot presumably is getting wet. And secondly, the river and the, the, the flow of the water has passed on. So everything in life is, is in a state of flux. And actually how we react to that and how we deal with that flux sets us apart in terms of the meaning of our existence. Diametrically opposed is Parmenides his contemporary, who believed that everything is one. There is no change. Nothing can come into being and nothing can come out of being. Nothing can come, nothing can come from nothing. So this is much more a philosophy of existence as it is as a state rather than as an ongoing process of being and becoming. Right, so this is the initial list of Western uh, ancients. And when it comes to Socrates, sorry, the slide seems to have gone slightly awry. Let me just follow down back to where we were. And there we go. As far as Socrates is concerned, he's probably the most famous uh, Greek philosopher of all time. And we already covered the uh, notion of the unexamined life is not worth living. I think uh, we've talked about this in the previous slide, but it's, it, you cannot be overemphasized that you need to explore, you need to be critical in your life before you can come up to any conclusion uh, as to whether something is, is right, is, is correct, and actually can be seen as a fact. And it was Socrates in, the, in Athens, in the Agora, who used to lament uh, and, and interrogate his interlocutors in terms of various notions like what is justice, what is love, and uh, try to get them to understand that by exploring these concepts themselves, that there are contradictions, there are issues that they need to consider, that they shouldn't accept the first notion of these concepts, but continue to explore uh, these notions as something that uh, develop uh, during your life, uh, as well as uh, other people's uh, interactions. So this is uh, the main thing here. I suppose uh, as far as Socrates was concerned, um, you know, by doing these investigations, he thought of himself 
that is not knowing very much and uh, you know he was perturbed that uh, his fellow Athenians don't didn't seem to be as knowledgeable as as he thought uh, they would be and therefore he went and uh, saw the oracle at Delphi to actually explore who is the wisest man in Athens and the uh, oracle uh, answered that it was indeed him uh, that uh, was the uh, the most wisest man in Athens and I suppose Socrates thought about this and he came to the conclusion that he must be the wisest man because he knew he knew nothing whereas other people thought they knew a lot but knew nothing so uh, I suppose in modern terms he would be called he would be called he was conscious of his incompetence whereas others around him would have been unconscious of their incompetence right now let's get further into some of the philosophical ideas starting with Plato uh, the pupil of Socrates uh, living in the uh, 4th and 3rd century BCE and the founder of Platonism right his main contribution really is the world of ideas and theory of forms that our life and our existence that we see is only the phenomenal world around us outside this realm exist separate concepts like the concept of horse the concept of justice the concept of beauty these are all things that exist in another realm and we can approximate to this in terms of the way we lead our life now the way he described that is also in uh, absolutes and universals such as beauty justice and goodness exist separately they're not something abstract they're not something abstracted in our reason but they actually are real entities that exist in another space humanity can have an intuitive grasp of these concepts and uh, by having this grasp can move from the concept of those uh, notions to actually applying them in context actual manifestations such as earthly entities represent only pale imitations of form so you know a real horse is only a pale imit imitation of the concept or form of uh, horse which would be perfect the meaning of his existence, existence therefore is to attain the highest knowledge which resides in the good so this is a very different notion but actually approximating to the good the absolute in terms of the concept of beauty justice and goodness for example it will get us to understand those concepts and at least in some way or form uh, apply them in our in the context of our lives and this is where the the good resides the attainment of the good feeds the soul through eternity so as far as uh, Plato is concerned the soul is immortal it lives on and on and it is purely a process of remembering our previous existences and building on, on, on these in our current existence and as far as education is concerned for uh, Plato it is actually a process of drawing out it's a process of enlightenment this is something we the thing everything already exists in the world or in the universe and it is our place for a teacher to elucidate that to literally draw out for us uh, to give us this knowledge right before, before as far as Aristotle is concerned that is a, a pupil or the pupil of Plato uh, lived in 384 to 322 BCE 
had a very different attitude. And I've given you here not a particularly legible bit of the School of Athens by Raphael. Uh, to the left of this image, which this image is Aristotle, to the left of this image is Socrates. Uh, sorry, is Plato. And Plato is pointing up into the heavens of the, uni the world of the universal forms, whereas Aristotle would have none of this. He is, has his finger pointing firmly to the ground, to the material world. Now, in terms of uh, uh, Aristotle's key uh, point, he rejects Plato's worlds of form as, a f as forms are simply the general of the particular. So I suppose he doesn't, he inducts rather than deducts. He goes from the particular to the general. The meaning of existence needs to be cultivated. It is something that we have an active part to play in. And uh, he points out that this, this point is something about reaching a certain state of thought, of behavior, which we come on to in a second. This is not a matter of knowledge. So it is the... The purpose of existence isn't just to know, which is interesting because some philosophers interpret philosophy as a love of knowledge, epistemology. Uh, as far as Aristotle is concerned, and I'm certainly Aristot Aristotelian in that respect, I think the, the uh, purpose of philosophy is the, the uh, love of wisdom is much broader uh, than just a mere knowledge. Being and becoming are both aimed at achieving the good. So both the way we are and the way we become in terms of our behaviors, actions, words, deeds, etc. are all aimed at achieving the good. As you know, uh, Aristotle is the, uh, the founder of, of early logic and his four causes, the material uh, cause, what something is made of, uh, the former cause was the form of it, the efficient uh, cause in terms of who made it, and then finally the final cause, the purpose for which it was made. And uh, clearly the purpose of existence of materials that uh, humans produce, such as axes, combs, etc., have a very defined uh, purpose bestowed to us by ourselves. Uh, rather than uh, being out there already as a form, as Plato would have it. The highest good is pursued for its own end, not as a means. So the way to achieve a flourishing life is to actually carry out your life in terms of your actions, behaviours, attitudes, for their own sake, rather than as a means to attend another end. Now this is represented by eudaimonia, which literally means a good spirit, uh, which leads to a flourishing life. I suppose the best way of summarizing that is that actually uh, if, if you are, have a positive disposition towards yourself and to others and you are exploring life with a intention of progressing from one uh, state to another by, by self-enrichment in terms of your knowledge and your behavior as well as how that uh, uh, relates to other people. I think that's probably the best encapsulation of eudaimonia. And as far as Aristotle is concerned, eudaimonia enriches the soul through the pursuit of excellence. But as the body dies, that dies. The soul does not move into the afterlife. So it's a very different philosophy. It's a, it's a much more of a philosophy of uh, discovery for yourself in terms of creating meaning uh, of your existence rather than finding meaning of existence somewhere out there in the ether, in the abstract. The meaning of existence is a way of being in the world. 
Good. Well, I think uh, you know we've we've covered a lot of ground already, but there's some way to go. So please uh, stick with me. Uh, you've got the Cynics, another school of philosophy in early uh, Greece, uh, who are rejecting. I suppose the Cynics are like the the hippies of the 1960s. They they reject all social constructs, refinement. They want to live in accordance with nature. The virtue is achieved by leading a simple life, shunning wealth, power, and so on. And you need to be free from social conventions and norms. And one of the uh, philosophers who took this to an extreme is Diogenes, the Bauer philosopher, who, uh, it is said, was once visited by Alexander the Great, who mentioned uh, to Diogenes, that if I wasn't Alexander, I would want to be Diogenes, to which Diogenes supplied, uh, replied, if I wasn't Diogenes, I would like to be Diogenes. And that just shows the self-assurance or arrogance of a philosopher uh, in the presence of the conqueror of the ancient world. But uh, there were also the Epicureans, it started with Epicurus and his edict, and this is going to be played back later in the in the uh, in the nineteenth uh, century uh, through utilitarianism. The greatest pleasure and the avoidance of pain is seen as the key meaning of existence, and all the existence is formed from collisions of atoms in space. And the only reason why we have free will is because of the randomness of the paths of atoms. Now, Epicurus actually distinguishes between two forms of pain, which is obviously the one thing to be avoided. One is ataraxia, which is fear, the fear of something, and aponia, which is bodily pain. Now, as far as Epicure, Epicurus is concerned, we need to aim to free ourselves of both of these pains. Now, Epicurus is often mistaken for hedonism, Cyrenaicism, uh, like Aristippus, but that isn't actually the case. The greatest pleasure and the avoidance of pain, as far as Epicurus is concerned, is much more basic than hedonism. You know, his idea of a good life is actually meeting in the agora, discussing things with friends over some wine and bread. This is not the, the hedonism of, of the modern world. And the highest good is friendship. And the way we act in the world and the way we behave towards others is equally uh, foundational in terms of leading a, a good life. And the meaning of existence is a shared life and free from pain and anxiety. It is not something that you achieve by yourself uh, as an individual. It is how you interact uh, with others in the world. Okay, uh, moving on to skepticism and stoicism. Now, stoicism and Zeno of Citium, going back into the uh, sort of fourth century BCE, goodness and peace of mind are derived from virtue. It is by acting virtuously that you actually receive freedom from suffering or apathia. Uh, and apathia, is, in the modern terms, is obviously apathy. This is not what's meant. It is. Apathia is, is a freedom from suffering. Uh, living in accordance with nature gives you that freedom uh, of suffer from suffering. And apathia is achieved through logos. Now logos is, is a very differently interpreted word in the ancient world. In this context, it means reason and sound judgments. You know, you do not need to suffer from fear or pain if you are prepared to invest sufficient time to reason through the situation and from which you then derive sound judgments. Virtue arises from a will in accordance with the order of nature. A good soul, eudaimonia, uh, once more.
skepticism, like Pyrrho in uh, the 4th century and Arcelsius probably in the 3rd century BCE. Uh, again, uh, similar, uh, not quite, uh, not quite as uh, uh, goodness orientated as the Stoics. Uh, as far as the skeptics are concerned, we should suspend judgment. We should doubt everything. We shouldn't accept anything as necessarily true. Now, Pharaoh uh, took that to an extreme and had to be rescued by his followers uh, several times, crossing various roads and dishes, ditches, so he wasn't actually run over and killed. But he took that to an extreme. But I think skepticism in general is, is actually a suspension of judgment or epoche, where you don't just accept what's right in front of you. You are skeptical. You, you are open to both sides of the argument until you understand which side of the argument uh, presents a better explanation of what is before you. The meaning of existence lies therefore in inquiry and tranquility, ataraxia. And it is, it is about this exploration of, of the nature of uh, existence that you should conduct in a way that is tranquil rather than agitated uh, because only through tranquility do you have a frame of mind to be open to different possibilities. As I said before, it's all about investigation of both sides of the argument and then coming to a reasoned conclusion. There are no absolutes. Everything is probabilistic. Nothing is absolute. All we can know are appearances. So we can only ever know the phenomenal world around us. Uh, but the meaning of existence lies in being calm and of an inquiring nature. Right. Well, finally, uh, in this tour de force through the uh, birth of philosophy, uh, we reach scholasticism. Now, this is a very interesting uh, period in uh, in the in the last uh, 2,000 years, stretching from probably about 500 uh, uh, after Christ to about 1,500 or so. And here, with the with the formation of religion, for example, Christianity became uh, the, the state religion of uh, Rome. Uh, through the Council of Nicaea in 325 uh, CE uh, by Constantine, who uh, gathered the bishops around him to actually have a accepted corpus of, of scripture that would be seen as acceptable uh, within the empire. And uh, this led to uh, integration into sort of Jewish and Islamic and Christian religious doctrine afterwards. So the point I'm making here is that actually what is happening is that uh, uh, philosophy in scholasticism is subsumed within religion. Initially within Christianity, uh, so following the uh, Council of Nicaea in 325 BCE, but then also uh, into, into a Jewish uh, uh, philosophy and Islamic uh, religious doctrine from the 6th uh, century, 7th century uh, in the Common Era. Uh, now the significant Catholic, Catholic and Islamic influences in interpreting philosophy uh, existed within religious doctrines. and. I'm, I'm not sure. I, a lot of uh, philosophical commentators would regard the uh, scholasticism as the Dark Ages rather than the Middle Ages. I, I'm, not, I'm not entirely convinced that that is true. I mean, we've got some very interesting characters here, uh, starting with St. Augustine, who is one of the founders of, uh, of Christianity. And uh, he was uh, initially a Manichaean, uh, but then converted to Christianity. His key uh, uh, slogan was "Si fala sum," if I exist, I err, I make mistakes. And uh, when he was a Manichaean, he he liked the pleasurable life, and uh, uh, he he prayed to God to make him chaste, but not just yet. He wanted a few more years of uh, of joy and pleasure. Now, obviously, the Dark Ages or the Middle Ages or Scholasticism started really with the fall of the Roman Empire in 476 in the Common Area. 
and uh, the emperor uh, Justinian forbade the teaching of philosophy, which led to the closure of the Acad academy in 529 CE. Now, I don't want to say that there are no interesting philosophies that arise here, because there are clearly lots of very important scholars, particularly also in the in the Arabic world, like Al Farabi and Al Ghazali and Ibn Rushd, with whom without whom uh, translation of Aristotelian thought, most of Aristotle would have been lost to us in in the West. So there's definitely been a continuation of philosophy from ancient Greece. However, it was subsumed within the religious uh, doctrines and the religious faiths, both uh, within Christianity, Islam and also in uh, Judaism. So this really brings us to the end of this particular lecture. I hope, hope you've enjoyed it. I hope uh, you've managed to glean something new in terms of uh, the birth of philosophy, the early thoughts about philosophy in terms of the meaning of existence, and also in terms of the return to some extent to a fusion of religion and uh, philosophy in the Middle Ages. Now, in future lectures, that sort of union might continue probably in the next lecture when we talk about the wisdom of the East, because uh, uh, philosophy and religion aren't as clearly delineated there. But when we get on to the Western philosophy uh, beyond the uh, Middle Ages, we find an ever increasing division uh, between religion and philosophy. So Let us know what you thought about today's podcast and consider making your donation at www.brlsi.org. We look forward to you joining us again for many more podcasts on literature, science, philosophy, world affairs and many more.